Turning points change the course of our lives, whether it's a big decision, overcoming an obstacle or tragedy, or taking a leap of faith. These stories of inspiration and resilience are what Turning Point is all about. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this episode of Turning Point. I'm your host, Priya Sam, and today you're going to hear an interview that was recorded on IG Live on November 29th. My guest was award-winning singer and songwriter, Havaya Mighty. Havaya and I are both Fanshawe College alumni, and we are so thrilled to have Fanshawe as a sponsor of Turning Point this season. Enjoy the interview. We are live. There we go. It always always takes a second for us all to kind of get, get connected and everything, but Havaya, it is so wonderful to see you. Thanks so much for joining us today. Of course. I'm so excited to be here. Yeah, I, I'm really thrilled to have you. We've got a lot of people joining, so I'll give... Um, people a second here before I kind of formally um, kick things off. But look at this. I think we picked a good time, right? Four o'clock. People yeah, were working ready to maybe end the day a little early. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I resonate with that. Yes, me too. Yeah. Well, yeah. a huge we're, welcome we're to everyone who's joining us. Um, wow. This is an Instagram Live joint event with Turning Point Fanshawe College. Um, Havaya and I are both Fanshawe alumni. Um, I'm the host of Turning Point, and I'm really thrilled to be joined by Havaya Mighty today. Um, how I, I feel like I don't you need no introduction, but of course you're an award-winning singer and songwriter. Um, and as I mentioned, Havaya and I are both Fanshawe alumni. Oh, it looks like we might have lost uh, Havaya, so we'll just hold on um, a second here, um, give her a minute to rejoin. Um, but in the next um, half hour to 45 minutes, we are going to hear about Havaya's biggest turning points. I got a little sneak peek and I'm super excited to share them all with you. So just going to give Havaya a second to join. Thank you all so much. Oh, somebody says I want to work with her. I can see why. Yes, she's absolutely incredible. Um, oh, there you are. Don't know what oh. happened there. Just kick me out. Oh, okay. I'm <laughs> Glad you're back. But anyway, you get to make an entrance now, right? You got more people here. So yeah, there we go. Yeah, of course. Of course. Grand entrance. <laughs> so, Havaya, I actually want to start by going back in time a little bit. Um, when did music become an important part of your life? Hmm. I think music was a, an important part of my life. Very young. I was put in singing lessons at the age of four. I have three older sisters who were in piano lessons all at the time that I started singing. So it was just always in the household creating music playing together uh, practicing together and even just me seeing as a vocalist the instrumentation of the piano being played as well it was always around um and we i did music lessons singing lessons from the age of four to eleven uh so it was a very instrumental part of my entire youth and of course have it, being around sisters being in choirs uh and they were all as well very musical with a lot of output and then when uh, I moved to Brampton, so I was born and raised in Toronto, uh, music lessons in Scarborough. And when I, was, when I was 12, that was when I started rapping because the music lessons had stopped. Uh, became unaffordable, we moved to Brampton. We won uh, the most amount of scholarships you could get, so we uh, no longer could source the payments of the lessons through the scholarships. So we, there were so many reasons why the music lessons had to stop, but the music never stopped, so. Yeah, I mean, I'm glad you mentioned this time in your life because it obviously was really impactful. This, I know I've read some articles and, and heard some interviews you've done where you've spoken about this move from Toronto to Brampton. Um, and it sounded like it, you know, there were positive parts of it, but there were some difficult parts of it as well. Absolutely. Um, you know, growing up in Toronto, I think my experience was not what the experience is like today. I mean, there's a lot of issues with Toronto still. We have a, we have a housing crisis. We have a lot of issues. Um, but when I was growing up, where we grew up was uh, not the most uh, financially uh, lucrative area, uh, but it was also extremely white. So we were the only black family. And we were treated uh, like the only black family in the, 19, in the early 1990s, uh, which was unfavorable. And we weren't really like welcome in the area. And there was a lot of uh, vandalism uh, and targeting our house because of the family. We were also a large family, mom, dad, three, four girls at the time, and then eventually a boy. So uh, it was a difficult, uh, it was a difficult upbringing because in order to protect us, 
my parents kept us kind of in the house. I wasn't really allowed to go to the park that was right outside the house. I wasn't allowed to make friends or invite anyone over. And so I feel like my origin years were very um, just only learning from my family and learning from my sisters. I didn't really have a scope of what society really is. And I think I grew up with some silent, like silent un inequalities and unfairness, injustices that came out in the, in the form of anger or disappointment or upset. But at that age, I didn't know what it was. So, you know, the move to Brampton meant a lot in the sense that Brampton was extremely multicultural. The education system was more welcoming at that time at least from the area we were in, in Toronto to the area that we moved to in Brampton. And uh, the big part, I would say, of my creative output, because I started to make friends, I started to go to the park, I started to find my personality, I started to express myself because it was finally safe to do so, right? So um, definitely a big part of my upbringing is both my origin in Toronto and my upbringing in Brampton. So sometimes people will say, you know, Hawaii is from Brampton or Hawaii is from Toronto, and I like to say, born in Toronto, bred in Brampton, sort of, <laughs> or raised in Brampton. Yeah. Th thank you so much for sharing all of that, because I think, you know, some of these issues still persist today. Um, and one of the things I've really taken from your message and, and what you have just said right now is that music is something that really is some carried through, right, even through these difficult times. And that this move was also part of your evolution, because you mentioned in um, at the beginning there that this is also when you discovered rap. Yes, moving into, uh, to Brampton and no longer doing the lessons. We also lived so far from Scarborough, so the commute to do the lessons in, in addition to the cost of the lessons was just, and I think that created a, a void. You know, I'd been doing lessons for seven years and I knew that music was a form of expression that I loved and yet it felt like, oh, we no longer have access to this. But there were changes. I lived in a different environment. Computers were a thing. Um, and I think because of that, I was able to find music in a different avenue when I found rap at that time. I didn't really grow up in a household where a lot of rap music was being played by my parents or by my older sisters, but I gravitated towards it. And when I had access to search for things through the internet, that's when I really, and I, you know, started to work at McDonald's, got my first little job. I, I really got enthralled with what music is. I was writing for two years from the age of 12 to 14. And around that time, I think I started working around 14 or 15 and I invested in a, a webcam mic it was like two dollars from the dollar store and that was my first microphone to record and I I just really through the use of the computer through this love of music that no longer had expression or output I found rap I found the ability to, to tell stories over beats uh, I found production even and I would definitely say that everything was planting seeds for this moment but that time frame was where I started to create my own music. Of course, with singing, you learn to sing a lot of other people's songs, Broadway, Disney, all this, Annie, all this. So I was growing up, Lion King. So I was growing up doing that and learning breath control, learning how to utilize my diaphragm, learning how to enunciate all of these things, which are so Im imperative to being a singer. And so when I found rap, I was able to transfer those skills, which I think was a really uh, lucky thing for me because like the breath control that comes with singing is, uh, it's more difficult to utilize the diaphragm of singing than it is rap. So I feel like I came in with like these, these skills that made it a lot easier for me to really just focus on telling the story. I wasn't really like, focused on breathing or focused on enunciating. I already knew how to do that. It was more, how do I tell these stories in a new way? Because rap, of course, a lot more words, a lot more breaths. The, the production is much different than Broadway or Disney. So yeah, I, I guess my variety and expansion of music understanding really started to grow between the ages of 12 to 15. Hearing this origin story um, really is providing such good context, I think, because as I'm listening to your music, I'm like, oh, okay, it's hip hop. Okay, oh, it's rap. Oh, we've got some instrumentals. Oh, we've got some Afro beats. And I feel like it's, it's hard to label. And I think that's also one of the best things um, about it and the reason that it resonates so widely. Um, I hope I didn't miss any genres in there, but like, how would you describe your style? You know, I think it's a blessing and a curse that I don't know how to. Um, of course, in this music industry, it's like any other industry, you kind of have to understand the product. And with music, it's more than just understanding that you make music. It's like, but what kind of music and what stories do you tell? And what is your narrative? Who is your audience? And so I spent a lot of years focusing on telling my stories and learning who I am. Many more years than I did focusing on what the brandability of it is. 
or how to kind of box that in. So yeah, I, I you probably did miss a couple of genres because I do so many different things. I think one of the major things about learning business at this later part of my career is that I am learning that uh, I, I, I'm learning that there's such a wide expression, and I love that. I love that about the music that I create. I would love to be able to explain in a couple of words what that sound is and i feel like that is something that i would love to work on over the next two years and be able to increasingly create music and not create boundaries but also understand how we who it is for and who will enjoy it and so they can have a quicker access point to that music but uh i love the path that i've taken where music has has dictated first where i end up and the style the style and the sounds have been authentically pretty much what I'm listening to and what I'm resonating with. You know, on my latest, my latest project, Crying Crystals, I was doing a lot of Afro, uh, hip hop, rapping, but like some is a little bit old school, some is a little bit new school trap. And then you also have like a little bit of the, the R&B uh, vibes. And uh, I like to go across the board in all ways, you know, I, I've held myself back. If I could, I would make indie music, acoustic only, uh, choir music. Like I, I love you like my voice. I would make acapella songs. Um, but it is a business, you know, at the end of the day. And one of the main things I learned at Fanshawe in the Music Industry Arts program, which I took in 2013, uh, 2011 to 2013, one of the main things that I learned is that music is not just music, it is a business. And you do have to consider that other side. So I think that's a, a really cool thing to recognize because even though I'm, I'm a full-time musician and have been since 2019, I'm still learning what it means to be a music business. Yeah, that's such an important message. Um, and I'm glad you brought up Fanshawe because um, we do have to thank um, Fanshawe alumni. They are sponsoring this live right now. We have a few new people who are joining us as well. So welcome to those of you who just hopped on. Um, this is a joint event between Turning Point and Fanshawe alumni. And we're so pleased to have Havaya uh, Mighty as our guest today. Uh, we're both Fanshawe alumni. Um, you mentioned some of the lessons you learned at Fanshawe College. Um, how did your time at uh, Fanshawe impact your career? I would say it planted a lot of seeds. I don't know if those seeds planted or or manifested, I guess you could say, until years and years later. But it planted a lot of seeds. One of the biggest things is understanding the business acumen that you need to associate with being a musician. It's it it, it seems oxymoronic. It seems like those things don't align, but they must in order to be able to uh, be successful and have that be the main bread and butter. So I'd say one of the main things I learned about that is 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 the fact that it needs to be considered and yet still it took seven years before i was actually a full-time musician um and able to do this full-time and still i would say it's taken an infinite amount of time because i'm no longer i'm not there yet i don't know when i'll be there where i feel like i thoroughly understand this industry uh, the thing about what fanshaw taught me as well is they talked about adaptability and how you can never get comfortable in this music industry which is like interesting to hear because when I look back at some of the things that I learned, they're not even applicable today. Even when we were looking into grants in this country, you have the ability to uh, apply for, for finances for the arts. And if you have artistic output, you can, you can make a case that you need some resources in order to have the output be all that it can be. And even some of the platforms that existed back then, like factor, for example, is a well-known uh, a funding agency. And the way that factor functioned in 2012, it's completely different. Like it, you, I had to relearn the platform. I had to relearn the software, and I think I've had to do that twice since graduating. So that's just one small example of the of seeing in real life the rhetoric of you can never get comfortable. You cannot feel like this doesn't require adaptation, and uh, yeah, I, I think learning how to create balance between these two things, making art that you love that is not dictated by an audience understanding that you have to care for your audience, you have to know who they are and you want to reach them. It's such a, I don't know, I'm very, very inspired by it uh, as a young entrepreneur in this field. It's just so different than like selling like a product and then the product stays the same. You know exactly who will buy a car cleaning product. They, they have cars <laughs> or, you know, or they, or, they, or they work for a company that, you know what I mean? Like you know who's going to buy that product. With music, you don't know because it's a very oversaturated market with so many different themes and different types of output. You have no idea who your audience is. You almost have to make the music first to figure out 
who you're reaching. And you almost have to get feedback from your listeners to know what impact you're having. As For me, as a woman, as a black woman who's doing a lot of things, I didn't realize that that was so impactful until my late teens, which was after graduating, where people would continue to say things that weren't the most favorable to hear. They'd come to a show and be like, wow, you're so good. I didn't expect that, like for a girl. You know, like little comments like that where you don't even realize. You're just like, okay, thank you. That's cool. And then over time you realize there's a preconceived notion of like a lesser output from somebody that looks like you, from somebody that occupies the space that you do. And over time, I realized, oh, not only do I have these important things to say, but just existing as a black woman, that is impactful as well. And my career is predicated on that as well. So there's just, I just think what Sancho has taught me, going back to the <laughs> question, is that the learning doesn't stop. The learning never stops and never changes. You have to be willing to adapt. You have to be willing to look at this as a business and you have to love it. You really have to love it or else it starts to not be fun. Yes, that adaptability factor is so crucial because you're right. I mean, I graduated from a different program. I was in broadcast journalism, um, but I would say that was one of the biggest lessons I learned at Fanshawe as well was the fact that, you know, you probably know as well, similar situation, like the industry is changing so much and what you do as a musician, what you do as a journalist is so different than what it was five years ago, 10 years ago. So yeah, I certainly... There was no yeah. TikTok. There was yeah, no TikTok. Exactly. Like Instagram, I don't know if Instagram was running the show. Twitter wasn't X. Uh, Facebook was relevant. Like there yeah. are so many small changes just on a social media uh, avenue where you could access fans. The things that we used to do to reach people is so different. You used to post a Facebook video and tag your friends. Like that's just, that is not reaching. We used to have Snapchat at a point. Like I don't know who uses that now to reach new people. So uh, that's just like a small aspect of, and like you said, like within your industry as well small aspect of how it doesn't stay this it doesn't stay the same the entities as well like back then we wanted blog features and like premieres and 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 that's not really the focal point either now it's like it's more i can't even say what it more is i'm still like adapting and learning but yeah i don't know it never it never it never stays consistent this industry in a competitive labor market postgraduate studies can really help to set you apart and Fanshawe College offers more than 50 programs to do just that in under one year. There are full-time and part-time options available, and many of the programs are even offered online. You'll leave with specialized skills from their career-focused curriculum, and many programs even offer credit toward industry designations. You don't have to wait until September either. There are January start dates for some of these postgraduate programs. To find out more, visit fanshawc.ca slash postgrad. Again, that's fanshawc.ca slash postgrad. You can also click on the link in the show notes. Yes. Well, speaking of major changes, you had this big turning point in your career in 2016 um, when uh, you released a rap cipher that went viral. So tell us about that moment and what happened. Yeah, I would say that was the turning point of my career. So there was a platform called Team Backpack. They are like an underground rap platform and they do a lot of ciphers or they did a lot of ciphers and they were big on Facebook. Facebook was very relevant at that time in a sense of you could go viral on Facebook and I, you still can maybe, I guess, but it was just more relevant then because we didn't have the TikToks of the world. And so more people, these the same amount of people existed and they were all siphoned on that app. Facebook was a team backpack. They had a platform, they were doing a cipher and they came to Toronto because they're based in the U S they came to Toronto and they wanted to do uh, all male cipher, all female cipher. So they got, got like a producer to make a beat and, and then they scouted out the artists that they wanted to be on the beat. So they scouted out five guys. They scouted out four girls. And we were invited to be a part of the cypher. Funny for me, I remember, like, at the time I was working at Long & McQuaid, which is a music retail shop any music lover would know. Um, and I think this cypher was set to be on a Sunday. And this was, like, the first day that Long & McQuaid was open on Sundays. And I remember feeling like, there's no way I can get my day off of work to do this. Like, that's where I was. Like, I don't want to get fired. Like, I can't miss work for this opportunity because I could not imagine what that would turn into. So I didn't think it was, like, worth potentially getting in trouble with my boss or whatever. I need to make my money. Uh, but I remember, like, when that cypher was happening, there was someone behind the scenes. And I remember he said to me, it would be in your best interest to be there. 
I'll never forget. Because I was not a networker. I'm still learning to be that person that's not super social. Definitely was like make, make music in my basement type of kid. And he was like, it would be in your best interest to be there. And that like hit me in the chest because I think I was not going to go. But when he said that, I was like, okay, let me just do my best. I, I worked on getting my shift swapped. I did the cipher. Uh, it was me, an artist named Phoenix Pagliacci, Lex Leosis, Keisha Fresh, the four of us. I met them for the first time that day. We did the cipher and it felt like synergy. It felt we were wearing the same outfits, colors, and I'd never met them. And the cipher just, it felt like a moment in time. And I remember leaving and feeling like, wow, that was, I've never felt anything quite like that. And then the cipher was edited, whatever they did, what they had to do. Team, team Backpack dropped it for International Women's Day. So they dropped the male cipher. It was like John River, KO, a lot of really great artists, male artists from the rap landscape in Toronto at the time. And uh, I saw their video that came up first. It was doing really well. And um, I was like, if that speaks to what ours might do, that would probably be the biggest moment in my career. That's what we all kind of realized. And um, we, we put it up for International Women's Day representation. We were occupying space and it went viral. Like it went viral. And it, like I, they chopped up the, they chopped up our verses and they dropped the, the solo verses. They also dropped the whole cypher with all four of us. I remember I got a million views in three days on Facebook and uh, it turned into like two million views in a month. So it was like consistent, the, the amount of people engaging. I started to get recognized in real life. People were like coming to Long McQuaid, my job, like, are you, the, are you a rapper? Are you the girl in that video? I saw you on Facebook. And that's when I realized that it could be real. Like, making music could be real. I, I've always made music, and I never cared to monetize it, never cared to reach the fans, truly. Didn't even know that I didn't care. I just liked making music, and it, like that's as deep as it went. When the cypher came out and I realized the impact you can have and the amount of people you could reach, it was a mental shift for me. This was February, March, March of 2016. It was... A pivotal moment in my mind of oh this is the most amount of people you've ever reached with anything you've ever done and if you don't convert these people to if, if, if it doesn't matter enough to you now to make that shift go work at a bank go work at a bank go work at clothing retail go you know but if this is really like this is the moment i had to recognize that it was a moment and i was like you know what my goal here now is to create a project I don't want this cipher to be the last thing that people know me for and then I get old. So I immediately started working on the album, like immediately. And I started setting goals for this album because before I'd made bodies of work, but I never cared to monetize and I never cared to grow. And I never knew what music industry was. But now I had Fanshawe College. I had the, the learning, I had the understanding and I had the cipher. So I was like, oh, this is maybe with this... It, maybe with this leverage, I could reach a booking agent because that's who's supposed to get me shows, right? And maybe I could get a manager because that's supposed to uh, that's supposed to be who opens more doors for different opportunities, right? I started to remember the seeds that were planted earlier, the team members that are supposed to help you get to the next stage, and I started to recognize this is the this is the moment where you amplify yourself and you reach those people. So I worked on an album, and my whole intention for the album was number one, so that I was not relying on the cipher because it's gonna get old. And number two, to utilize it to set goals. And I set very specific goals. I was like, I want a booking agent. I want a manager. I want a grant. And that was my main three goals. And over that year of 2016, while I was working on an album that would hopefully afford me those things, the Cypher, the, the four of us that were in that rap video, also kept getting called to do the Cypher again, at different entities. So I'm working on my solo stuff actively, heavily. And I finally feel like, I understand. Oh, you don't post your food on Instagram. Oh, you're supposed to post your music. It's a resume. Oh, oh, the, the email needs to be the same on Facebook as this platform. I started to realize that my business acumen was trash and I started to fix it. And I spent all of 2016 fixing it, working on this music, but also doing this cypher and rapping with these three girls. We became a rap crew because we kept getting uh, asked to do this rap together, like oh, over and over and over to the point where we were like, should we become a crew and like do this and like tour and make an album? So 2016 would mark the creation of a pro project called Flower City, which was inspired by Brampton, uh, the, the, the nickname of Brampton. And uh, 2017, I put out my album. It was uh, March of 2017, so a year after the cypher. And I was able to get a booking agent to come to my release party. First time I ever had a release party. That was also a new goal of mine. The booking agent was interested. It, it the the business acumen started immediately when i dropped the album the booking agent was interested we started having business talks 
then he introduced me to someone who became my manager, my previous manager at the time. And then she introduced me to other team members. I was able to get my first grant. Everything that I wanted, everything that I wanted happened. And I think it only happened because I really planted the seeds and I really believed that it could. All the time before when I was making that music, I knew I was a good rapper, but I didn't actually believe I could do anything with it. So nothing happened because I didn't believe it. The moment other people were like in the comment sections on Facebook, like, is that girl from Lana McQuaid? Did she? I was like, no, I'm not. Just, it's not just me who thinks that this has merit. They do too. And all that mindset shifting led to me actually developing team members. And then in 2017, uh, as I was developing these team members, I was working on an album with the girls that I met through the cypher. And then in 2018, we put up an album called Pledge as a group. While we're doing that, we started touring Canada, Winnipeg, um, Saskatchewan, going places I'd never been in Canada, playing rap music. Simultaneously, I developed this solo team and we were like, next year we'll do our thing. And uh, these years really changed my life because it, I was making music the whole time, but finally I was marketing them. I was like making artwork and I was understanding, okay, I got to put it on like CD Baby or TuneCore or DistroKid. I was learning how to actually get your music on iTunes, how to, you know, Spotify was becoming a thing. How do we get on playlists? Working on all of that. Um, and so 2017 was Flower City, my solo album. 2018 was the group album, Pledged by the Sorority. And then in 2019, that was the, okay, everything that we've learned, everything that we've, let's put it into a, a, a fully supported solo Hawaii Mighty record. And that was, that project changed my life. That was a project called 13th Floor. That was the project that won the Polaris. That was the project that... Yes. And I mean, it, it literally changed my life. And, it, and for a lot of people, they would look at me now. I'm two projects beyond that. I've won a Juno since then. You know, people would look at me and say, oh, you, you know, you popped up out of nowhere. The seeds have been planted since 09. You know what I mean? Like since before Fanshawe, since before the sorority, since... But it's interesting how all of those different avenues, I would not be who I am today if not for them. If I didn't do the rap crew thing, I wouldn't have toured... Uh, and been and got so comfortable on stage like i was getting better but like my live show was my bread and butter truly as a solo artist and touring with a with a group writing with a group writing from different perspectives now i have to think about what you guys think about heartbreak it's not just what i think about heartbreak writing from that perspective meeting team members and understanding oh this is what you do this is the space you occupy which saves me from worrying about that there's so many different aspects to it to theory to harmonies to contracts uh this industry is actually so wide because you need different uh you need different experts in order for it to function right like yeah. you in order to be a musician you need a contract expert to oversee the business and you need a booking agent who understands territories and understands what regions you would do good in you need like you need all of these different team members it takes years to develop and you you can get there when the music when you love the music you can just take your time you know? Yes. I mean, I, this is such an important point too, because um, I think, you know, people see you now, as you said, and see the success and say like, oh, you just kind of came out of nowhere. But hearing this whole origin story, I mean, it does take years and it is, I mean, of course, being talented and passionate is so important. But I think, you know, what you have really said here in the last few minutes is how important it is to understand the business side, to find the right people to support you um, and to push yourself, right? Like you really push yourself out of your comfort zone um, af after this cipher. I mean, even doing the cipher probably. Yes. Um, but and then to kind of like really um, take advantage of, of that moment and to use it as a jumping off point for everything else you've done. Um, it's yeah, it's really cool to hear that whole path. The other thing you mentioned, um, you, you mentioned your album 13th Floor and the Polaris Prize. We have to talk about this because this is such a massive moment. You become the first hip hop artist and the first black woman to win the Polaris Music Prize um, for Best Canadian Album of the Year. So tell me about like that moment, the moment you won. Oh, yeah. Um, again, like that was uh, pivotal in terms of the career. So like, I'm gonna be honest, I didn't expect to win. Uh, I'd heard about the Polaris. I didn't really get what it was, but it just seemed like a super huge deal at a uh, really early stage in my recognizable career. I've been doing music for so many years, but nobody knew. Nobody knew that. So to be able to create a body of work and finally have it be supported. I mean, I've never had a label. I'm not signed to a label. I'm still not signed to a label. 
but I have team members, and I and I learned that there were. I finally learned there's a distinction. You can you can have assistants and not necessarily give all your rights away, or like because a label really it's hard to know how it operates because they are the infrastructure. So I kind of had my own little infrastructure that functioned like a label without having the label, and um, so I learned that you know you have to submit your album by this time for these things so it needs to be done by certain dates starting to think about all these things i would never ever consider because it's music i want to put it out when i want to put it out that's how i thought um but i remember with the polaris i think that like the, the the jury or the panel like they reached out they asked us you know we know that you have an album on the go will it be done by this time it to be considered for this thing and um so i made sure that it was and there were just really amazing artists that were also nominated, you know, the, the biggest artist being like Jesse Reyes, somebody that I look up to, somebody I think is an incredible artist, Shad. And um, I just, it wasn't really about a win. It was about getting in that room in front of that many people in Toronto who are a part of the music industry and getting an opportunity to perform. That was the win for me. Same with, same with the Junos. I don't want to jump ahead, but it was the exact same feeling again, where it's this big recognizable thing that other people are aware, acknowledges, artistic merit and the thing that i love about the polaris and why it was so career changing is because i always as, as soon as i got recognizability from the cypher i was always worried about being boxed in as just a rapper or just a battle rapper because i'm not a battle rapper but the vibe you know i was you know coming with this you know aggressive and that was what people saw and i was like i hope people don't think i'm gonna do that all the time because i'm like i'm not actually that person like i want to get in the studio and play my guitar and like i'm too multi-dimensional to only be that but i'll give you the bar sometimes and i really wanted the opportunity to 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 not be in the box and i think that's why when the cypher happened i immediately started working on a project because i wanted people to understand i'm more than what you've seen this is your entry point this is an introduction and um the polaris is an entity that acknowledges the best Canadian album that year, based on artistic merit alone, it is not based on streams and based on recognizability or being the biggest artist, which I think is the thing that kind of allowed me to get in the door and show that despite maybe not having the same recognizability, I was I was I was creating something that was new and fresh, and it was acknowledged by winning the Players Music Prize. So it was then acknowledged as the best Canadian album based on artistic merit alone which instantly made me a musician and not just a rapper, right? And I, I think I, I get so nervous about that concept because I think people try to box what rap is into a, like, mm -hmm. it really, they put boundaries mm -hmm. on it. And rap can also be so much more than just rap. And so I felt like by being recognized, f f this album being recognized in a space where there's artists and albums in, that are not in the rap field as well being acknowledged, it, for me, felt like it took rap to a new avenue. It took rap to a new place. It took me to a new place. And it also allowed me to be, like, an artist with artistic merit in Canada. That's, that's, that's all people knew at that point. And it opened up, first of all, I won 50K, which was a great investment because I reinvested that into my craft. And I was able to go full-time musician off of that. And I'm still full-time now. So I invested the money. I didn't buy no chains. I did it. Like, I focused on the music. I reinvested into beats. And now I'm sitting in a house, right? off of the money that the music made so it's just it's 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 vast i couldn't even imagine that i'd be here from there but i knew based on the fact that there's hundreds of people in this room and all these people that make music for a living i'm like this is a good place to be i know this is a good place to be uh it made me viable as a performer in other countries i instantly got opportunities to perform in the uk to perform in the us um i think the tough thing about the players for me was that it was uh, it, it was right before the pandemic. So I do think that my career was heavily impacted by the pandemic, heavily, heavily. Um, we had a lot of plans for 2020, following 2019, there was a lot of momentum and then that happened. And the momentum really, really did get stifled. And I was worried, I was like, is there, am I gonna have to go back to working at Long & McQuaid? Am I gonna be able to keep sustaining myself off of music? in an industry where my whole, this whole year was supposed to be touring. I suppose that was the year of we're gonna break into the US and my booking agents no longer had jobs. No one had a job. Um, somehow, some way, the Polaris allowed me to get like, well, my output as well, but the Polaris, the fact that my name got a little bit of recognizability allowed me to do a lot of back end work in 2020. And that's what sustained the finances that's what allowed me like the music was maybe not the forefront the same way i wanted it to be because i wasn't able to travel internationally or do interviews but 
I was like producing for Holt Renfrew and working for their artists and, you know, working on like I think the back end, like produ production and DJing. And um, I remember I did voiceover work. I did a commercial with DoorDash. I did something with Good Life. I f almost forget these things now. So such a lifetime ago. But that was when like, I started doing some corporate work. Because I guess in the pandemic, the corporations still have to exist and they have to find new ways to reach yeah. people. And they have to find social media ways of reaching people. People are stuck in the house. And so that was a, a pivotal moment for me in terms of uh, also recognizing the music industry is also bigger than just making your own songs. There are so many avenues and streams of, of revenue. And then full circle, you know, it's all kind of coming back to these accolades, the Polaris, uh, and then, you know, like the prison prize, which was an acknowledgement for music video. So that was another thing where I won some money for my music. Um, but it was for a music video. That, that money was then reinvested to black creatives, $10,000. I ended up putting my own money in it. It was like $12,500 straight, straight to uh, not music creatives, uh, black entrepreneurs. Um, <laughs> yeah, and that was one of the bigger focuses post the Polaris. And then, you know, I put out an album called Stock Exchange. And that ended up winning the Juno the following year. So that was the 2022 focus. And then, you know, being nominated for a BET award, which is like, how did we get here? But how we got here is the Polaris, right? How we got here is the Cypher. How we got here is 29, 2009, not even 2019, 2009, when you could find my earliest bodies of work on YouTube. Like, that's where it really began. And so now we're here, 2023. And it's like, what's next, you know? And uh, yeah, it's just so exciting because i don't know but like I, I i feel uh lucky to be in this position where i get to just kind of explore and figure that out yeah i mean all of that adaptability the creativity the being open to doing you know projects that are a little different than what you would have maybe imagined i mean i think that just speaks so much to your commitment to making this work too and being open to you know and to being adaptable really um which is kind of a theme throughout your story uh, one of the things i actually really wanted to ask you about was because you mentioned storytelling a few times and i'm also very passionate about storytelling but this is like something about your music that is really special i mean every um every song has a story there's a lot of like almost like poetry in um in your music it's so beautiful so i'm curious like what from a um like when you're creating does the story come first does the beat come first or does it depend yeah 100 percent depends okay i think uh if there's production that's really strong and it's in a certain vein like it's sad it sounds sad it sounds happy it's very upbeat that could dictate the theme of the song but sometimes you have a theme on your heart and you don't have the production yet. So sometimes it works backwards where you've written lyrics. You don't even know the tempo. <laughs> you don't know how long the verse is, but you have a couple bars written down and you know you want to transcribe that to audio eventually, right? So sometimes it happens like that. Sometimes for me, it happens like a riff, like I'll be jamming on the guitar and the melody will come first. I'm a very big melody person. Probably seven years of singing before I ever rapped is the reason why. So for me, sometimes like the chord progression can get me before anything. And so just playing something on the keys or playing something on the guitar, that could be the, the point. And then I want to like build production off of that. I think there are no rules to how to start making music. Some people have a, maybe a consistent way they do it every time. But what I love about the expression of music is it could start in so many ways. And this is probably why when you listen to the album, you're like Afro, you know, R&B, ballads, this, that, like, where is the structure and the structure is really in the my structure is really in my ability to actually perform my ability to rap to enunciate to utilize my diaphragm to put all these words in and know when to take a breath know how to do that live like that's the continuity that i have but i could do an indie song i could you know and that's just um be probably because there is not really a structured routine to how the music is created um the structure kind of comes after when you're like, how do I market that? And that's something that I'm learning more. That's not that's that's not the origin. The origin is you know like the, the craft and the music. And for me, sometimes the best songs come from conversation. It could come from like I'm somebody that takes a lot of inspiration from my own stories, of course, but a lot of other people's stories. I was a storyteller as a kid. I used to write fiction books. And so I think like if I were to sit down with a friend and they were to tell me about their breakup in detail, I would probably write a song about that. 
Like, if they, if their story makes me impacted, or I feel like really, if they are able to talk to me for 30 minutes and, I, and I'm invested, I might make a song about that. Maybe not specifically about what they went through, but about the energy they encapsulated that I now feel. That's usually how my best songs come to existence, is encapsulating an emotion. And then me extrapolating on what I feel about said emotion. So there'll always be my story at the end of the day. But, like, being able able to kind of cap encapsulate i guess an emotion and extract that's where my best songs come from you know like and yeah i love the ability to be able to do that that's something that before i ever found music i knew i could do through storytelling through yeah. writing yeah i could tell stories that i didn't live um not my own but i could transcribe stories that i didn't live and that was separate from what music is music taught me how to now tell my stories that i did live through a new medium, you know? So, yes. I guess no routine is my answer. <laughs> yes. Oh my gosh. Well, this is, but this, I think the storytelling aspect is a really interesting thread that carries through everything because it sounds like, you know, even if that melody comes first, um, you know, that you're still really focused on like, what is the story? And I do think in your performances, it really comes through. Like, you're not just saying the words, there is a lot of emotion and feeling behind them. And I think that's one of the reasons your presence is also so magnetic is because you're really invested in the story behind the song. And like, I, I think for me, that's something about you that really stands out. It's really cool. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. I wonder now, you know, we've really like taken this journey through your career, the origin story in Toronto, moving to Brampton, you know, working at Long and McQuaid, doing this rap cipher that really changes everything for you and gives you that push to really focus on music. That was in 2016. So here we are over seven years later. So as you reflect back on that turning point in 2016 and think about where you are now, now, what would you say is the biggest lesson you've learned in that time? Mm, that's a good question. The biggest lesson, oh man, there's so many though. I don't know, how can I, how can I even say one? I've learned so many huge lessons. Number one, I think one of the biggest things that I've learned is that nothing is more sellable than knowing yourself. You don't even have to be good at music, actually. But if you know yourself <laughs> and you know you're not good at music, you can find a way to sell that. You can, you can find, because you know yourself and you know what the perspective is, you know what the perception would be like, and you know what you need to give, the bare minimum you got to do. Like, I would say knowing yourself is, is one of the key instrumental things to the visibility of this music industry. Because I would say the cipher was the most visible that, that I had, like the most visible moment that I'd had and that I utilized to, to, to increase visibility. Before that, I was just making music in my basement, like I mentioned. And I didn't really know myself. I only knew that I loved music. And I only knew, you know, as a young Black person in Canada, I knew I had some stories to tell there. I knew I had some experiences I needed to share. I knew I had passions. I knew there were things outside of me I was passionate about. But I didn't really know myself. And luckily for me, I would say over the last few years, this journey has allowed me to find myself more than anything. I think it's a beautiful journey. I think it would be hard for some people to learn themselves in the public eye, though. Like, like I, like I feel like I'm doing. Um, but it's such a beautiful journey. And when I look back, I think one of the biggest missing components of me as an artist when I was younger is that I had no clue who I was. I was just making music and like so authentically loving it. Like, just I was, a, I was like a DIY kid, you know, like. I make a song, I'm gonna put it on Twitter tonight. I'm not gonna market it. I probably won't share too many times. Like I was that person, I didn't wanna post too much. I didn't wanna bother my friends. Like I didn't believe, I didn't believe, but I loved it, you know? And I learned over time as I started to believe in myself that I didn't before. And that it's taking you so long to get where you wanna go because you didn't even think you could. Like I definitely thought I was gonna work. I was gonna be like a, maybe in a lawyer. I was interested in that for a little bit or, but too, too much schooling, too expensive. Um, <laughs> And there was always, there was never, uh, there were things I had interest in, but never something I was uh, as passionate about as music. And I think it works, ba it worked backwards for me. A lot of musicians that we see that are successful, why they become successful is because they, we like them because they know themselves and we want to know them because they can share themselves with us. And I think I was back, I was working backwards where the music came first, 
But like what's behind the music, you didn't really, you don't really know. I think people are still learning who that person is, even me. But the things I've learned over the last two, three, four years, oh man, like I, I think I'm just so happy in life. Like I'm so genuinely happy in my life, even when I have the sad moments because I always know what I'm chasing or not even chasing, just like, um, not chasing, that's not the word. I always know what I'm going to find. Yeah. And just literally like just more towards. of me. Yeah, which yeah. is just more of me. And it can be in any avenue. You could read a contract and, and understand the jargon and be like, wow, like, I don't know, like you can extract aspects of yourself through literally anything. Yeah. Through literally anything. And um, so I think that's probably the, one of the biggest things that I learned um, that is not necessarily specific to the actual output of the music, but I just learned that like knowing yourself is the thing that makes this fun. That's the part that makes this worth it. And you learn more once you're okay with that and you accept it. And it that like money is cool. You could make more money doing something else. I don't really get like the scheduling is cool, I guess. Like I'm not in a nine to five, but like I'm on someone else's calendar all the time. If they want to book me for something and I've accepted it's based on when you want me there, da 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 da. You could create a more open schedule doing something else. But finding yourself, like, in, in the public eye and sharing music that you want to know how it's going to impart to your fans, there's nothing like this. There is nothing in the world like being a musician if you learn to love it. And I would probably say that's the biggest thing that I've learned over the past few years. That's so beautiful. And I think, uh, obviously, your passion, your authenticity, you know, your willingness to be open comes across, and it really is connecting clearly. It's connecting with people. Uh, you just, like, you know, you're doing so well in your career, and just getting this opportunity to get a look behind the scenes and um, and hear about your origin story was really impactful. So thank you so much for your time today. It was so wonderful thank speaking with you, you. Habaya. This was a great conversation. I really appreciate it. Yeah, me too. And we also have to thank Fanshawe Alumni for sponsoring this event. Um, for those of you who joined us late, we are going to be releasing this interview as a full turning point episode. So we'll keep up, follow along. We'll be posting it um, in the next couple of weeks. And again, thank you to Fanshawe for sponsoring this episode. Thank you so much, Havaya, for being here. We all look forward to following your career and seeing what you do next. Thank you so much. It means the world. Thank you for everybody that's been listening and viewing. I hope I was able to impart something, even a monumental thing, in this conversation. And uh, I hope to connect with you all in the near future. Absolutely. Thanks again. Bye, Bye. everyone. Bye. Thank you so much for joining us. And again, a huge thank you to Fanshawe College alumni for sponsoring this event. If you're enjoying the show, please leave us a five-star review. We love hearing from you. You can find me on social media at Priya Sam. And you can also find out more about my new coaching and keynote services at PriyaSam.com. Until next time, take good care of yourselves and of each other.